I'd like to try to do is um, come back to a number of the points that were raised by the various speakers and um, yeah, see whether there's more to them and uh, the extent to which we might be able to come up with uh, ways forward to uh, go uh, further with them. Uh, I'm going to start with Nia. So, Nia, you mentioned how in centenarians in your study there is a very profound compression of morbidity in terms of the um, uh, 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 time between getting such and such a disease and actual death. But if we define compression of morbidity not in terms of these major diseases, but rather in terms of function, like activities of daily living and so on, how much compression of morbidity do you see there? Uh, it's less than mortality. It's a really good point. In fact, I, I think the reason that they really die so fast is because they are at the end of their life. They are less resilient, so then they die <laughs> immediately. That's partly of what happens. So if you ask about ADL, is uh, and by the way, 100 is is not a magic number. Right. Some will live to 115. Some you don't know that, but 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 you have to remember that those 100 years old are not young and healthy. They right. are old and healthy. Right. So it depends really what you mean by healthy. Yeah, and I think this is actually you know it, it would be interesting to see how this changes over time. So for example, in the International Classification of Disease in version 10 that came out maybe a decade ago. Um, sarcopenia was introduced as a disease for the first time. This is the progressive loss of muscle mass that we see with aging. And so, I mean, I guess if you were to compare the length of morbidity in your centenarians with or without including sarcopenia as one of the um, conditions, that would be quite an interesting comparison to make. And, and yeah, and, and we, have, we didn't analyze the data, but we have the data because we have body composition mm -hmm. on all our uh, centenarians, and we can, uh, we can look at that. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, so actually, now I mentioned the ICD. Of course, very recently, just I guess less than a year ago, um, the International Classification of Disease came out with a new version, version 11, which was a very big deal for this community because for the first time, aging was included in the classification. And it was included in a very correct way, rather than just including it as a type of disease, uh, you know, so that you either have Alzheimer's or you have cancer or you have aging, which would have been a disaster. Um, they did it correctly. They did it as what's called an extension code, which means that essentially it's a qualifier that's applied to other things. And uh, my understanding is that this could make quite a lot of difference to the incentive structure within the whole industry, uh, with regard to the value of developing drugs that are, or uh, therapies in general, that are particularly um, relevant to the, uh, to the aging population. Um, have either of you thought about that or come across reactions to that within industry? I think one fascinating thing about investing in longevity is I thought when I started that the easiest thing would be to find an indication for all of our companies. They have drugs that target fundamental pathways of aging. What's easier than to pick one age-related disease and go forward with it? But the number one failure point for most of our companies has been picking an indication. It's taken way longer. It's been way harder. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a large part of it. And you have to fit yourself into a box that isn't built for you. Um, and so I think it'll actually make a huge difference to investing because it just pragmatically has been such an issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, 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 I have two points about it. First of all, the WHO is not influential, at least not in the United States. They can decide whatever they want. Governments, they decided what, what do they want. The second point, indication like sarcopenia or frailty, in my mind, are too late. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, doesn't make sense. We can prevent it. Why should we treat that? I think it's very hard to treat those conditions. Yeah, so actually, let me push back on that a little bit, because for sure, it's, it's always going to be easier to develop a treatment for, some, for people who have uh, a certain early stage in the progression of any chronic condition. But you know, the people who are at a later stage are people too. So we kind of, I feel, as a field, we have a moral obligation to continue to push forward in research that would eventually be beneficial to those late stage people, even though, as you, so, as you so rightly say, it is more challenging to develop those therapies. Well, look, we, still people are going to get diabetes and heart right. attacks and other things. You know, we're not stopping uh, that. But 
for us now, since aging is not accepted as a target, mm. to pick on sarcopenia and frailty, I think is tough on us. Mm. I, I think we have to move away from that. Uh, another question about big pharma for both of you. Um, so when I talk to the general public, one of the big things that often come up in terms of whether this is a realistic future for society is people will say, oh, big pharma will hate this. They will, they will viciously oppose the development of these things because they make money out of sick people, and this is all preventative. And my essential intuition here is that no, that essentially once the public, who are ultimately the, 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 the payers for this, once they become more comfortable with preventative medicines, just in the same way that they're already comfortable with a few isolated examples like statins or ACE inhibitors, um, that you know, the big pharma will follow the money. But what I don't know, because I just haven't had the right conversations with the right people, is whether big pharma are already seeing it that way so that they'll be ready to become more, um, more active in the preventative medicine arena in response to progressively um, shifting opinion, public opinions. What do you think? What do you find? I, so I think I might have a bit of a different take, which is we mostly talk to people in big pharma who are running BD or they're running research. And the people who in big pharma are thinking about aging at least from my experience, are the most part former scientists. And they're fascinated by the mechanism. So they actually don't think as much about, like to them it's more like immuno-oncology where you have a mechanism that's incredible you've just discovered that can give you an ability to treat a disease you couldn't otherwise, but it's like the genetics of it is what draws them in and kind of this idea that there's a novel area of biology to exploit. And so I think they view more along that lens. And I think they really haven't shifted to thinking of aging as a disease. It's still like aging is a mechanism mm -hmm. with which you can treat diseases. Mm, yeah. um, and you know, Aubrey, it, it's kind of what you t talked about, the, the <coughs> politicians and how they are thinking. Uh, first of all, the pharmaceuticals have to have everyone as a client, right? You get over the age maybe 50, 60. I mean, we'll see how it develops. You need a drug. But it's not only that. Uh, they haven't stopped uh, doing two dr new drugs for diabetes or for cancer or anything, those will be in development. We'll improve the, gr the, the drugs, we'll start uh, doing combination of drugs and things like that. The, the, future, the future of business for the pharmaceuticals is going to be better, not worse. Mm, yeah, I, I mean, I, I tend to agree, but yeah, I think it's like how we get there, you know, the, the nature of the transition is perhaps a little unpredictable at but, this point. But you know, I, I think we have to realize, it's not that, you know, in five years when TAME is done, the pharmaceuticals will develop the drug and in one year we'll go from 80-year-old life expectancy to 115, mm -hmm. right? right? It's all going to be gradual and adaptive and there'll be <laughs> failures and stuff, but it's going to be uphill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've got a question about the global um, ecosystem in this. So getting away from uh, the US and Western Europe, um, let's start with the Far East. Of course, you've got you know, some of your ancestry from there. So um, I have found it very intriguing over the past decade or more that I've been um, you know, getting on stage and on camera as often as possible to try to um, spread the word, that I get a disproportionately small number of speaking invitations from the Far East, in general, not just any particular country. Like, I've never been invited to Japan. Um, and I feel that this is a symptom of a very deep-seated cultural distinction that may be holding the whole of Asia, actually, back in terms of their ability and their, interest, their inclination to, um, to contribute to this, this crusade. Um, the only way that I can see it is that the attitude to um, aging as kind of not a disease, not a medical problem, is even more deep-seated over there than it is in the West. Like, that, the, um, the, obviously, the uh, Eastern cultures have a very strong reputation for um, you know, having great respect for the elderly and integrating the elderly into society better than we do in the West. But maybe, it, in some way, it's a counterproductive type of respect. Would you not take Japan's like, stem cell uh, sort of leadership as like opposite evidence of that? Stem cell, well, yeah, but isn't it a one-off? You know, I mean, yes, it happened to be a Japanese research group that made this enormous IPS breakthrough. And <laughs> you're you're, you're into PR to, play. Yeah, okay, I think, cool. yeah, I, I haven't seen it translate into a more general, you know, appreciation and understanding of, um, uh, 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 of the problem we're trying to work on. I, you know, there, there are two things. First of all, China 
It's in a huge crisis because they had one kid for 40 years, one yeah. kid for family. There, there's a huge problem. And they're doing things. I see what they're trying to do. They're trying to steal from us all the mm -hmm. time. Jan Vig has a, a lab in China now. Yushin actually have, uh, had a lab, you know, friends of ours. Uh, so China is doing things. Ch China is spending money about it. Uh, you know, we have people from Singapore. Yapsen Chang is the dean of uh, NUS. They're really uh, uh, interesting and aging and are, are, are playing role. But I, I think one of the things I realized, and this is really from my time in Singapore, uh, I, 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 we had a meeting and the, and the health minister was there, and I, I said to my host, I, I'm going to say, why not Singapore first? Singapore should, and, and they told me, you know, you, you have to realize Singapore is a small place. And Singapore will want to be first second, <laughs> but not first, because to do first, you need to have a lot of investment. And United States should do it, basically, they say, okay? But, but think about it. You go around the world, the world is looking for other leadership to be first. Maybe UK should be first. Sure, uh, I wish. Um, yes, and of course, uh, 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 of course, in recent times, Singapore has taken a very important big step, you know, creating a big centre for healthy ageing, which is still in creation, of course, but uh, recruiting another uh, prominent friend, of course, Brian Kennedy, to run it. So, yes, I mean, I, I, I guess I'm seeing this change. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying this will never change. I just, it just seems to me that, yes, as you said, Perhaps they don't want to be in the lead. Maybe it's personal against you. <laughs> There's always that possibility. Um, um, so um, another thing that you mentioned and that we've all mentioned periodically is the longevity dividend. So that is a term that was first coined now more than a decade ago, I think, by four very prominent members of our community um, who decided to get really active in trying to sell the idea that the, that even modest progress in postponing the health problems of late life will be just spectacularly profitable economically. Um, and, you know, these were extraordinarily respected people. One of them was Bob Butler, who was the first head of the National Institute on Aging. Uh, all the others, you know, very credentialed people. And oh, they made a lot of noise, wrote papers, and you know, talked, to pe talked to influential policymakers and so on. And uh, it didn't really get anywhere. You know, it didn't actually result in big changes in the amount of money that government put into research in this area. And my take on that back then was that maybe the problem was that it was only an argument for saying a, a certain amount of progress will have this economic benefit. What it didn't have was any argument saying that a certain amount of money spent now has a respectable probability of actually ac achieving this, this, this postponement of, of health. So that this kind of left the audience of actual, you know, the corridors of power with the feeling that, well, who cares how big the number is contingent on success if the probability of success is zero? You know, any number times zero is still zero. And, uh, and therefore, it's not an argument. Um, now, today, of course, there's a great deal more, um, you know, people, uh, most of the biology community are willing to st talk about a respectable chance of significant success in a respectably small time frame. So maybe things are better. But there's another problem that faces the whole longevity dividend effort, I believe, which is that politicians ultimately don't know, only need to know that a particular policy would be advantageous. They need to know that the public think it would be advantageous. And I am still seeing, you know, as I probably um, uh, showed in my own talk just now, um, I'm still seeing an extraordinarily small amount of progress in shifting public opinion in favor of actually wanting this to happen. So I wonder what, from either from both of you, what, what your perspective is on the rate of change of public opinion. Yeah, is it, oh, come on. I, I, so uh, the CEO of Life Bioscience is Mahmoud Khan. Mahmoud Khan is a male clinic trained physician that became the head of Takeda and then was vice chair of Pepsi. And he now retired from vice chair of Pepsi and said, I want to do something very interesting, which is like 
you know, Jim Mellon, it's like the, the, all, all, those, all those people. And he said something that really caught me, uh, you know, and I, I think we all have to know that. He said, you know, in healthcare, we are doing terrible mistake of how we talk to patients. You know, we show television ads that can convince them not to take those drugs that are killing them with side effects, right? It looks terrible. He said at Pepsi, I realize we don't have patient, we have consumer. Consumer means he has to go to the web and see a picture and say, I need that. I'm going to get it right now, okay? He said Pepsi uh, sells lots, lots of shit stuff, okay? People, people buy it. How do, how do we talk to consumers rather than talk like scientists or talk to, talk to patients? And I think this is something that we should consider uh, that we're doing wrong. Not that I, I can give you an example, but I think we have to think like that. Well, yeah, totally. Uh, I'm reminded of a scene in um, a wonderful movie called The Invention of Lying. Who's seen that movie? Anyone? Um, it's, it's a fantastic movie in which, um, early on in the movie, no one lies at all. No one's actually thought of the concept. And there's an advert for Pepsi that goes by, and it says, Pepsi, for when they don't have Coke. Um, and uh, 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 it, it's a truly brilliant movie. Uh, anyway, so, um, uh, but, but, but my point is, yeah, Mahmoud may, may, may have got that right. In fact, I would say he's definitely got it right. But then when we drill down and we ask, you know, how do we actually do that? You know, how, what, what is the messaging? It suddenly becomes incredibly difficult. And I believe, you know, the, 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 the field of the biology of aging has had this problem since forever. All the words around, um, around what we do have connotations that, uh, that invoke prejudices. So I was very amused to see that slide that you put up of your original um, early stage. You didn't have it, it wasn't called the Longevity Fund. It was, it was called, called the Immortality Fund. Right. Yeah, we changed that yeah. really quickly. Um, you know, and, and um, even the word disease, you know, Come the revolution, when I run the world, um, it will be illegal to use the word aging and the word disease in the same sentence. Because whatever you say, you know, whether you call aging a disease or whether you call aging not a disease, it just creates too many con misconceptions in people's minds. We've had a few exceptions to this. L not long ago, less than 10 years ago, uh, one of our colleagues, Gordon Lithgow, invented the word geroscience which has become enormously popular with us, with the community, simply because it's a completely new, word, new made up word that has no baggage. The word juvenescence is going the same way right now. And so, yeah, I mean, if we could actually find marketing ways to do this, that would be great. But I've talked to really high-flying marketing people many times over the years, and they've always said more or less what my mood says, but that's it. Then they can't actually implement it. It's painful. Well, we, we were in a session uh, at, a, at a far event, and it was about immunization. And elderly don't take flu immunization. And they don't take it because it's effective only 40% or less of the time. So they have a reason, and you know, it's painful. And we were discussing around the table, how do we get them to take it? So somebody said we should give them a coupon of $25 to Google, and everybody ha has an ID. But then somebody said, you know, what the elderly dread more than anything else is hospitalization. Mm -hmm. And actually, they're less, th their hospitalization is tenfold less if they take the flu, even if the flu was, vaccine wasn't as effective. So maybe that's kind of the consumer thing. You know, it's not pretty, but we might, we might need to find something more dramatic yeah. too. It's actually yeah. interesting. I would disagree with both of you, and I'd be curious what the audience thinks. I, I think that actually this only changes if you have like immuno oncology level efficacy demonstrated in human. Like, I think what you're doing is like the single most important thing you could do to solve this problem. I don't think that you can actually solve this with vocabulary. I think it's like you have to go in the clinic mm -hmm. and show a like mm -hmm. extraordinary effect. And I think that's possibly going to happen in the next decade, but I'm just skeptical that like this will actually change a bunch in isolation of that. Yeah. Maybe the war on cancer is the best counterexample. Like. Can, can, can I make an, another point that I think is very important? We talk about aging, but those drugs are important for people who survive chemotherapy and radiation, mm -hmm. young people who age very rapidly after cancer treatment. Mm -hmm. HIV, they get diseases 10 years ahead of the time. 
uh, people with disabilities who are on chair and they cannot move and then they eat, they, they need help. If we want to go to Mars, <laughs> we need a drug because we'll get cancer by the time we get there, mm, too. Totally. So we, we have to realize that this is not only about us or getting old or the elderly. This is important for many people. Anthony's behind you, and he looks as though he might want us to wind up. <laughs> OK, yeah. Um, I just have one last thing that I'd like to raise. We'll just get through this in a minute or two. Um, I talk about the irrational uh, reactions that people have to try to defend aging, not only to say that aging is inevitable and we will never be able to have medicine against it, but also to say that aging is some kind of blessing in disguise. Uh, you know, I've um, been obviously encountering and railing against this, this for a long time, and so have you guys, and so have all of us who do a lot of public engagement. Um, you know, the, the, the weird thing for me is that it's such a deep-seated thing. People who are otherwise perfectly rational about everything will be completely crazy about aging. But then there's this absolutely insatiable desire to be up to date about what's happening in our labs. You know, I, when I started doing a bunch of media, I thought, OK, yeah, this is a fad, and you know, I'll be famous for 15 minutes, and then it'll all die back. But I'm still doing like 100 interviews a year. It's insane. So. That dichotomy is what's led me to believe that when people start to feel safe about believing that we're actually going to get there, then it's really going to be like a dam breaking, that the change in public opinion is going to be just terrifyingly sudden. I wonder whether you guys have the same impression, because this is really important, as I mentioned in my talk. You know, if it is going to be so sudden, then policymakers are just not going to have time to react. They've got to prepare. I think that is probably the most important point that you or anybody has made. And I just want to like second Aubrey's point. I think this is actually like extraordinarily uh, kind of interesting that in the field, at least for our fund, we're not focused on actually making people live longer with the therapies today as like our number one goal. That's actually a secondary goal. Our number one internal goal is to make people realize that it's plausible to impact aging by viscerally demonstrating in a clinical trial that this has occurred. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that as a goal of the field is actually, like, we can do that in this decade. Potentially, mm -hmm. and that's so important, and it's a different. That's actually a different goal from kind of the. Yeah, yeah. Well, in in uh, in New York, when I'm talking about people, I said, look, if aliens came from another world, and landed in New York, they have two problems to so, to 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 look at. First of all, to realize that humans are ruling the world and not dogs, <laughs> because the dog seems to the human seems to be scooping their poops uh, of the dogs. OK, once they realize that, they said, are you kidding us? You didn't solve aging yet? This is ridiculous. I mean, if they came from another world, they already solved it. Right. This, this is something, OK, and this is kind of where people need to be washed. All right, guys, thank you very much for your address.